now we're about to really get ready, man. We're about to really take you down. Hold your breath because we're about to go underwater. Mark, mm -mm -mm -mm. let's move on now to the impact of the funk and Prince. You and Dwayne, Prince made that lasting impression. I know you already touched on it a bit, so now let's really go in. When we talk about music in general, the funk, how in the world is Prince related to the funk? And we're still tied into hip hop because you mentioned before how Prince, you know, obviously wasn't a fan of hip hop early on, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, tie that in even more with today's hip hop. What, and I can already think off the top of my head, if you don't say it, I will, I'm sure you will though. Uh, what role does Prince still, what lesson does he even have for young hip hop heads today that they should be learning from Prince, not just in terms of sampling his music. Oh man. Um, but I, I, I'll let you just go fly with Prince and the impact of Prince, the funk, Prince, and tie that all together with hip hop. Oh, Mark, before, before you even jump in, I have to say another generational gap. I've always been a huge fan of Michael Jackson, who I always looked at Prince like, who's that cat? So, <laughs> and I'm like, what is he doing his high pitched voice? And why does he look like that in the covers? Why is he, nah, not messing with him. So I just wanted to go ahead and throw that in there. All right, okay? I'm going to touch that. <laughs> I was going to yeah. say, that's, that, good, that's a good. I'm one. glad you threw that in because I'm glad you did. Gotta, let me set it that in the background because Dwayne alluded to it earlier. That was another reason why Prince wasn't accepted in my house. My parents exactly. already weren't feeling secular music. So the yep. fact that you had this dude walking around looking like a woman, yeah, yep. he had his booty hanging out, <laughs> yep, and he was making songs like "Darling Nikki," you know, yeah, what? yep. These things are. I could not get into Prince because I could not play Prince in the house. So, yep. all right, Mark, yep. Give an explanation even to the young crowd. Why in the world should we respect him? Because yeah, Michael Jackson had his issues, but. Okay, Michael Jackson truly looked like a freak, but Prince embraced being a freak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm talking about more in the bedroom. And when he throws in lyrics, Michael Jackson talking about it doesn't matter if you black and white, but Prince is basically talking about it doesn't matter if you male or female. Now, granted, he might've been prophesying for where the world would be some decades later, but at that time, that was truly controversy. So go ahead. Look. Y'all stop me when I get to 17, okay? Because <laughs> I'm about to go in. Look, let me... Okay, this is but this is for everybody, but I got to address what Terrell said, okay? Because what he said applies to me too, because at that time in the, mid, in the late 70s, Michael Jackson was starting to develop his solo career. You know, he's no longer the little Jackson 5 kid. He wanted a more mature sound. When he dropped off the wall, I mean, even when he hit Destiny and then he moved into off the wall, this is Michael Jackson grown now. It's like, oh, right. So then when Prince comes along, that's the same thing I thought. I'm like, why don't he just cut it off and be a woman? This is what I first saw when I first saw Prince. I'm like, what? What is that? Right. And it took me some years before I could really get into Prince. I knew his early hits, but the look just pushed me away. It was like, I couldn't deal with like, what is that, right? Like I said, my cousins are the one who got me into Prince, but here's Prince's legacy that we have to understand, okay? Um, wow. Prince has wrapped up everything in the history of black music and put it into one package. When you look at Prince and you listen to Prince, you see Little Richard. You hear James Brown, you hear Sly Stone, you hear Jimi Hendrix, you hear you hear some gospel stuff in there, you hear some jazz stuff in there. Prince is blues. What's incredible about Prince that we need to respect these days is that he's a guitar god. And we just, when are we gonna see another black guitar god? It was like, there's a rumor that always said that the white rock market says after they kill Jimi Hendrix, we will never have another black rock god, which is why today, Prince is still doesn't get his props for being an incredible guitar player. It's like the critics didn't really recognize him as a great guitar player until he did this guitar solo on a, on that uh, George Harrison song. Some years ago, like Prince been jamming for years and y'all just figuring this out. Now, here's my thing about Prince. And this is what people need to understand. Michael Jackson sold the records, but Prince is the musician. And you're not going to understand that until you start looking at the liner notes, because when they first came, when Prince first came out, I thought they were just equal. It wasn't until I started reading liner notes like 
you pick up when you look at their both of their albums that catapulted them into stardom you look at michael jackson's off the wall you look at prince's 1999 michael jackson had the entire la musician scene on his album there was like 80 musicians on that album you look at prince's 1999 it says played by prince produced by prince arranged by prince he sung all the vocals he played damn near he played all the instruments he only had a couple people sing maybe some background this guy put together the whole album that's what blew me away we don't have people that's one thing i have to say that hip-hop has taken us back because they made sampling so popular that people don't want to be musicians anymore and i saw this really bad when teddy riley produced michael jackson's dangerous album Teddy Riley tried to play guitar and it sounded like crap. It's like, dude, hire a session player because you can't play guitar. There's a couple tracks on there. It's like, dude, dude don't do that. Um, I also learned from Prince what to do and what not to do. Okay. Prince was not able to let go of his control of his music in order to move into another area of production that would have made his music more popular with the newer generation. Michael Jackson was willing to pass the reins on to Teddy Riley, for example, because he's Michael wants to sell records. Prince was like, I can do this. But people wasn't buying Prince in the mid 90s because his sound was lost. By that time, people had moved on. So there's two things about Prince that we should really recognize is that we need to get back into real music, playing the instruments, knowing how to do vocal arrangements, knowing how to lay a bass on top of a guitar, knowing how to mix the, the drum machine into it together, knowing how to be able to a, a full rounded musician. That's what we need to get back with Prince because in the hip hop age, we're not gonna get that again. But the thing that we should not get from Prince, and this is what we learned from Jam and Lewis in their interview, Jam and Lewis looked at hip hop in a different way. Prince looked at it as this is some BS, I can create this in my dreams. But Prince didn't get hip hop and he dissed it and hip hop left him behind. Jam and Lewis, just like you just said a few minutes ago, even if you don't like the new music, if your kids like it, your kids like the new music for something, even if you don't. Jam and Lewis says hip hop says we can take other music and build music on top of it. And Jam and Lewis's career went further than Prince's because they were able to adapt to the new production styles, whereas Prince stayed stuck in what he was doing. So that's the legacy of Prince that I'm, I'm I could go on, but that's I'm going to sum it up that way. Get in there, Dwayne. I'm going to pick up on one little nugget that Marcus laid down that I can't resist. Um, and this is all related. So we talked about Jam and Lewis and their um, uh, production in their embracing the hip hop. When they did 1814, um, there, uh, is it Rhythm Nation that samples Sly and the Family Stones? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for letting me be myself. Mm -hmm. So, I, um, I don't know if he'll ever end up watching this, but the person I have to credit is a good friend of mine when we were in college. We have not been in touch. In quite some time. His name is Kevin Fair um, in Detroit, pretty popular DJ. He goes by the name of Mr. Monotone, DJ TNT, that kind of thing. He is the person that for all my life, I will say, put me onto Sly Stone. Hmm. And um, what was that song, Thank You For Letting Me Be Myself, which Janet Jackson sampled thanks to, I believe that was a Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis mm -hmm. production. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what, when I went, one of the things that's most interesting about that song, there's a part when the lyrics go, everyday people sing a simple song. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it say? Uh, Mama's in the back, it's all night long, everyday people. What he's doing is he's quoting the titles of his other songs. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that, you go, then you have to go, well, that's an album that he recorded like way back when. That was brilliant. Um, this pure genius mm -hmm. and those are the kind of things that as we talk about the funk um and i'm getting a battery low here so i may have to switch headphones in a second but what i will say going bringing it back to prince um like you said he it was everything it was the the way he dressed it was the the arrogance the the confidence and he was the guy that um he knew how sonically just to put like um when you talk about 1999 
it wasn't until after he passed away and I start revisiting that song that something in the water came up and it's oh, now emerged as one of my favorite songs. Have you heard it and live? I, I've not heard it live. There is but a what, live version. You've got to hear it. Okay. Okay. It became in that time frame of like right after his death, it became one of my favorite songs. At, like I said, as I revisited it, um, it's because of the content. Um, and it, basically the concept is that there must be something in the water because every woman that I've met mm. treats me bad. Mm. Okay. Yes. Like the genius of that is just phenomenal. And then like you, uh, Terrell was saying about the screams in that, it's like, how does he take these screams that are not technically, if you listen, they're not even on beat really, but he can do them and hit them in a way that you're going like, like, what is this? Even like years later, you're going, what is he doing? This is like craziness. Who would ever think this would work? But it was the the moans, the groans. Uh, and he was, my, my mother, as much as she criticized him, she would just say, he's nothing but a want to be a little richer. He was, um, he was, when it came <laughs> he to- He admitted it. Exactly. Jesse, Jesse um, Johnson admitted that. Yep. And you think about even the influence that James Brown had on all of these people. Mm -hmm. Now, this is somewhat blasphemous because I am, um, I like James Brown. I know a lot of his songs, mm -hmm. but you rarely will ever hear me say he was my favorite. Mm -hmm. I know that's terrible because he's influenced so many people it that I, I know. And I'm not saying he's not, <laughs> I'm not saying that he's bad. That's not, um, when people, one of the things I always say, and I'll, I'll pause it here because I'm going to probably have to switch headphones here. But when people say um, best, sometimes what they mean is favorite. And mm -hmm. I always make that distinction to say, whenever you ask me who the best is something is, technically what I'm saying is they're my favorite. Because right. the people that I consider of like the best mm -hmm. may not be somebody else's exactly. favorite. But, um, exactly, exactly. You know, we have with Fly, we, you've got uh, Grand Central Station. Like, there's all these different, um, and just to throw it out there, um, remember, there's a, co a, co a connection to uh, one Grand you know, a couple of generations removed. So there's all these different connections and ways that people don't think through. And I probably lost the point of your original uh, question, Deb, but <laughs> Prince, um, and I'm trying to talk fast too because I, I think my battery is going to go out here in a bit. But um, Controversy for sure was the, the song. And then I remember um, it's still one of my favorite songs off the album is Annie Christian. Um, oh my God, man. That I got to talk about that. Yeah. So I'm going to go switch headphones real quickly. Um, Y'all keep going. I'm going to put myself on mute and I'll be right back. All right, and, and actually, it's funny because I got the, I guess my hard drive ran out of space recording all of this. So now we're recording to the cloud. I probably, hopefully only missed like 10 seconds. I'm gonna be mad if the first part of this didn't come out. Oh, you. I'm gonna be mad, but it's still hot. <laughs> T-Real though, it's your turn, get on in there. Take yourself no. off mute, bro. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, um... Uh... What was the original question, actually? I want to make yeah. sure. We were talking, I'd asked about Prince, the impact yeah. of Prince, because he started, you know, you had brought that great point of how Prince looked, automatically made him problematic for many. And then the connection that, you know, you have Prince, the way he looked, but then his impact with the funk, and some way, somehow, if you want to tie that into hip hop, the relationship and the impact of still hip hop is all still a connected chain that I think a lot of the younger generation doesn't real they don't realize. They think Prince is probably this pop icon, crazy dude. Like you said, you can't really connect with him at all. And then, you know, the funk is over here, something that their parents might have listened to, but they listen to hip hop and it's something different. Is there any way that you can maybe tie that in or just even tell us, you already gave us an idea how you felt about Prince from your vantage point, even what's your perspective, just kind of being the young one in the bunch? Yeah, Prince so really that- was, a, was before your time, if you will. Yeah, very, I mean, being 97, I mean, uh, yeah, my, my parents weren't, obviously, I don't know they could speak to them, but well, so they kind of came around on the, they kind of came around on Big Daddy Kane and rolling all the way up to, um, you know, obviously they knew who 
NWA and all of them, and they just rolled up from there. LL Cool J kept on going. So I didn't get brought up in that funk era where my grandparents on my father's side, who were probably only 15 years older, him, they would have been on that right there. That would have been for them. So yeah, uh, like I said, I'm just being educated at this point and putting connecting dots all the way or backwards for me. So I'm just listening. <laughs> you know, but you, yeah. you still pointed something out. Mark, tie into this and say what you're going to say, but okay. I'm going to throw this out as well, though. For us, that 70s era is kind of before our time. Yet it seems like our parents were more into the 60s. So it's kind of like the 70s is a, I won't say it's a lost, lost art. Because it got diluted with disco as well. Oh, so, man. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's Wait. what I was going to say. That's more like when it goes there, I'm like, oh, I gravitated more over there just by right. seeing all the Afro. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, Mark, whatever you were gonna say, touch on that too, because I think that hurts the appreciation for the funk. It hurts the appreciation for Prince and that oh legacy. God. It's almost like James oh, Brown. What's the name of that song? My, my no. dad remembers James Brown. Of course, he knows James Brown. But my father said, and he told me, he, he pretty much. I sent him some stuff with James Brown. I, I can't remember what I sent him, but I know he had made that point that Dwayne mentioned earlier. My father was like. Yeah, pretty much. After the Temptations, I stopped listening to everybody. So Damn. for him, it was like once it got out of the 60s, he felt music just went, like we said with hip hop earlier, my father felt that same way about 70s music. So he never got into the funk, never got into, I mean, he got into disco a bit, but <clears throat> it's, it's really amazing. It's like that 70s, the funk is almost, you got to truly appreciate music because I don't know very many people where that's truly a part of their growing up. I don't know what, was it not getting as much airplay at that time? I, I'll say, on the airplay? I don't know. I'll say for me, the farthest I go pretty much with James Brown, unfortunately, is doggone Rocky. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> when he was, man, he was the big payback he, or something, that, that, oh, that is payback. That's, that's it. After that, I don't have nothing else. I'm tapped out. You gotta be kidding me. I, I know he's, I, know, I respect him. I know he's, I trust my, my, aunt, my, uh, people before me, my elders, but that's the part of the go. Well, I'll uh, just, wait, hold on, wait. No. You, don't, you do hey, man, know what you don't know. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Cut that brother's mic off, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, look. Man, I, I, dog, I grew up, I mean, I, I can't get into James Brown. That's another episode, okay? I'm going to just say that we wouldn't have music the way that it is if it wasn't for James Brown. There's just no way. There's so many facets of our music that came out of that guy. When we, I mean, we, we started off with the question, like, what is funk? You know, it's got blues. It's got uh, it's got gospel in it. Um, it's, 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 funk is on the one. That's what funk is. James Brown is the one. Bootsy, he taught Bootsy and Bootsy took it to George yep. Clinton and then it went from there. They didn't know what that was. It's like, what is on the one? What is on the one? Yep. <laughs> he, changed, he changed the rhythmic timing of the music because nobody was doing that. And they, they're still living off that funk uh, to this day. Okay, let me, to, because I've been taking notes because you brothers is bringing some heat. And so I want to just round up a couple of things that I wanted to say along the way that I wasn't able to say before. First of all, when I was still living in Detroit and I just saw... I used to go to all these different record stores that sold vinyl albums, used vinyl albums, right? All, damn near, I'm, I'm in eight years I've been gone, I see most of them have all closed. It was one I used to co go to called Car City in St. Clair Shores. It closed its doors. I used to buy so much vinyl in there. They had world music, classical music, jazz, everything was in there. So this, this goes back to our point of have something concrete, have something in your hand. The vinyl is disappearing, it's coming back. Um, you, Dwayne, you talked about the first time hearing some songs, and I distinctly remember the first time I heard Flashlight. I, I was in school, and this brother had this radio. I'm like, what is that? Flashlight jumped out at you. It jumped off of the radio like, that song was 20 years ahead of its time. With the That loud, banging bass keyboard line, it was... Flashlight hit me in 76, 77, the way 1999 hit me a little years later because they had these futuristic sounds that was different 
than what was going on in black music at the time. And the funny thing about 1999 is that the idea for 1999 actually comes out of a like a, a Mamas and Papas record. <laughs> you wouldn't believe that. But anyway, let me keep moving. Tidbit. When CDs first came out, Prince's DMSR was not on the first release in 1999 because it was not enough minutes on the, the original CDs that first came out. Next point, hip hop sampling. <clears throat> hip hop sampling sometimes took songs that I didn't like and made them into jams. I had Zap's first album with More Bounce. Everybody knows More Bounce, but they had another song in there called uh, Be All Right. I didn't like that song until I heard Tupac on Keep Your Head Up. I'm like, that song is a bomb. Now, Dwayne, you brought up Annie Christian. That song used to scare, used to scare the hell out oh, of me. Or it should have. It should. It did. Because it's a, it play really... on, it's a play on words, first off. Which well, not only don't... that. What I'm saying yep. is, I, I was in Georgia. Like I said, my cousins are the ones who turned me on to Prince. Man, I was laying in their room. It was like 6, 7 o'clock. And it was like dawn time. Man... I'm listening to this song, Any Christian, and the 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 light from outside shined on the the controversy album cover. And you know that demonic look Prince has on the cover, man, it scared the hell out of me, dude. And I'm listening to Any Christian. That song is kind of eerie to me. You know, he has songs oh, like that, is. like, and then you know, Darling Nikki. There's certain songs yep. that Prince puts out that just raises yep. the hair on your body. You know, it's yep. like, what yep. is that? Now, let me keep. I'm. I'm I'm going to be done in two or three minutes. Just bear with me. Another thing we can learn from Prince is that because he crossed so many genres, he ended up suffering for that. Because with 1999 and Purple Rain, he was able to merge pop, funk, rock, R&B, put all of that together. He brought the black fans with the white fans. He hit the pinnacle when he did it with Purple Rain. But what happened was that as he continued to try to mix that and record music, our fans were still divided into black and white. It's like rock fans, he's too funky. And for black fans, he's still playing that heavy rock guitar. So he that's what ruined Prince's career to me because he couldn't choose one side or the other because he had all of this going on within him, right? He suffered for that. That's what happened with his record sales, right? Um, Rough Riders. When we talked about Rough Riders, and I just picked this up in a DMX uh, a documentary a few days ago because somebody here said, this type of hip-hop that Puffy introduced, this, you know, this, this, the Cristal and the limousines, and that's not, the guys from the Rough Riders, they actually said this. It says, we came out with Rough Riders because we wanted to be the anti-Puffy. I'm like, damn, they nailed it, and that's exactly what they did. Now, Disco, I have a problem with this discussion because <clears throat> defining what disco in some ways gets a bad rap it depends on what type of disco you're talking about there's trash disco and there's quality disco who in here didn't get into that saturday night fever soundtrack i mean my father used to bump that cd every time we got a cd eight track tape remember when the fuji sampled it for uh staying out that just staying alive and Yep. That is good yep. disco. There's trash disco and there's good disco. Michael Jackson had elements of disco in his music. Um, disco actually comes out of the Philadelphia International Sound. That's where yeah. disco really started yep. with the whirling strings and the, the subtle bass lines. That comes out of Philly International. They just trimmed it down to almost nothing, which leads me to my next question. Me and my boy Dave have always asked this question. And it's funny because I'm talking about Saturday Night Fever soundtrack right now, but here's a question. Cool in the Gang had a song on this Saturday Night Fever album, and I want everybody, if you don't know this, you need to listen to this song. It's one of my favorite Cool in the Gang joints. It's called Open Sesame. Is that song funk or disco? That's my question. Because you can argue for both sides. If you don't know the song, pull it up. To me, it's a classic Cool in the Gang joint, but it's a question of, do you believe this song is funk or do you believe it's disco? Okay, I'm gonna let it go. Let me just say real quick, if I ever compete in a bodybuilding contest, my my the fantasy in my mind is to come on stage and my routine will be using Open Sesame. Because the way that <laughs> song opens, man, the way that song opens, mm. I mean, I just imagine when he goes, Open Sesame, boom. And then you got that pause. Boom. But it is like oh. immediately you should be hitting a double bicep, lat spread. I mean, that song, you nailed it with that. That's that's 
best ranking up there is one of the dopest songs that is. That's a good one. That's a good one. I give you that. Anyway, go ahead, Dwayne. You were next. I'm going to touch on, on the, the disco, uh, mostly because I am a disco lover. Um, even what I would say is some of the bad um, <clears throat> disco. So one of the things that sometimes gets put in there is like the bad disco um, is a song by the Rolling Stones. And I'm also a big Rolling Stones fan. Um, is uh, I, uh, I Miss You. I miss You. That is. Wow. Um, that is all up and down a disco song. It's not a rock song, it's a disco song. But what mostly makes me upset is, yeah, there were people who were trying to imitate the sound and they totally trashed it. Mm -hmm. But what, what mostly frustrates me about it is, as much as I love Madonna too, Madonna basically broke the heels of, like, disco is what later became, like, dance music. It's your Daft Punks. It's all of that stuff that... Got, still got played in the clubs, but it wasn't called disco anymore. It's all the same stuff. Dance and music. And it, it, had, it, it had a life of its own, and it continued. And like I said, uh, I think Daft Punk has done a good job of paying tribute to where they learn from. But on the same note, um, what happened with disco is... It, it basically becomes uh, almost a, a history lesson in, in race relations one-on-one. Mm -hmm. on one. That's true. And what it, what it really was is it was people revolting against something that they couldn't control and they felt like it was starting to influence things too much. And so um, there are a lot of examples of things that go on today that are not music, but the same thing once it's deemed to be too popular or too influential there's too black backlash. yep exactly <laughs> exactly and so um this is uh the, the bgs are are often cited as one of the like the funkiest uh white bands if you will mm -hmm. um and they their music like i said you like you said uh you mentioned things getting sampled as much as i like staying alive when white cleft sampled that it took it to a whole different level, and so you like that. I, I, I like what he did with it. Um, it is not my favorite refugee song. I wasn't crazy stretch. about that song. I wasn't crazy um, about that song. They had other ones that were way better, um, mm -hmm. and one of the things that is unfortunate, kind of going into a whole other topic, but one of the things about the Fugees is it was difficult to see a group you like so much blow up almost as quickly as it felt like they did yeah because it became their undoing and um i think they had a lot more to give in the way of a group and i'll, I'll just stop it at that <laughs> dang you know you touched on something else i gotta hit real quick and i'm gonna pass it back over to Dev. um I, I want i want you guys to be honest about this we already went down the prince road but let's take this in another direction well i'm, I'm gonna keep going in this direction you'll see where i'm going because you just brought up Madonna. And I remember the first time I heard Madonna because I thought she was black. I remember when I heard Holiday for the first yep. time. I'm like, yep. And then I saw what she looked yep. like. I'm like, that's Madonna. Exactly. Okay, so here's my thing. Sometimes I have a problem admitting that I like Madonna. You know what I'm saying? Even though she had she had some good songs, no doubt, but it's just I'm almost anti-Madonna. But this happened to me another time before. Now we were talking about looking at Prince for what he looked like. Like, man, I can't get with this dude. I mean, he got some draws on on stage. He got some bikini draws on stage and 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 leg warmers and boots and makeup and like, uh-uh. Get that, you know. But here's the funny thing. I'll never forget this. In 1983, I got this friend named Steve. And there was, y'all all remember, y'all from Detroit, y'all remember there was at least, I think, two or three Detroit audios that we had in the city. And me and Dev both lived off Six Mile. One day, me and my boy Steve went to the record store and we would buy 45s. It's like, you know, you had to tell the guy to get the 45 behind his back because you couldn't just get them. He was like, give me that, give me that, give me that, give me that. And there's this record I wanted to buy. But I'm like, man, I can't let my boy know that I like this record, right? And he says, give me that Time Clock of the Heart by Culture Club. I was like, you like that too? <laughs> it was like, I can't let nobody know I like Boy George because I'm like, look at this, look at this dude. 
And my boy Steve bought that record, so it kind of like opened me up, like, cool, I can buy Culture Club now. My boy ain't gonna think I'm strange, right? <laughs> Just wanted to put that out there. All right, I gotta share a story, and then T-Rail, I'll hand it over to you. But one of my Marcus memories, and we talked about this on another show. For those who don't know, obviously, you won't. Marcus is six four and a half, but yet he always seemed to love small, tiny cars. So he had this Nissan Pulsar. We talked oh. about this on the show. I brought oh, up. Oh man, can we keep it clean, dog? <laughs> Not only do I remember him classically for having that was one of the times he was bouncing Rick James, and the tremble was so high my ears probably started bleeding a little bit. <laughs> but I also distinctly remember him playing Vogue in that car. So imagine two brothers in this little bitty Pulsar listening to Vogue bouncing down the street. Oh and no, so, what are you talking about, dog? That's what are you talking about, dog? <laughs> but T Real, I'm gonna pass it to you and then I'm gonna come back because you gave me a, another topic that I wanna spring to on this. But T Real, do you have anything else to chime in on that? No, I have nothing. I'm just trying to soak it in as much as possible. I mean, you gotta realize somebody who I didn't really, I didn't have my first actual, my own um, shoot, iPhone, right? To be able to go ahead and listen to the music until I was probably like sophomore in high school. So that puts me probably like 2012. So I'm digging from 2012 all the way through as far back as I can. And it's like so much, I'm like, yo, like, I can only get, I can only capture so much without basically not having a job to, to dive in and really understand it all. So I'm trying to set it as much as possible. All right, all right. So I'm going to, because it's, I'm glad you actually said that as well, because that's right where I'm going next. Uh, we'll start back. Dwayne, we'll go to you. Um, one thing that, Terrell, if Corey was here tonight, he is another one that didn't get a chance to benefit. But one of the big things is, like Mark said, we were able to go and I was trying to find a picture. I wasn't goofing off on the computer while y'all talking. I was actually trying to find a picture of Detroit audio. So number one, people, take pictures of some of the places in your neighborhood because I couldn't find a picture of Detroit audio for nothing, yet that's something mm. that's all in our minds. Mm. But that era where we had Madonna, you mentioned Sting earlier. We didn't have, it really, I want to say there was almost like no such thing as a crossover. There was no line in the sand of segregated music. And Dwayne, you made reference to disco earlier. I think that's a perfect example because even the good Christian parents, yep. they listened to Saturday Night Fever soundtrack because it wasn't really secular music. It was a soundtrack. Right, so that, right. could that be the devil music? It was music used in a movie. And so right. my mom <laughs> her disco to burn, baby, burn. You right, know, exactly. Just yep. going to burn her. And she'd be, you know, trying to, I'm just doing my exercises in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody wore it out, like you said, Mark. Um, so T Real, you missed out on music really not having a color line. <clears throat> right. Was that more due to disco? Because disco, like you alluded to, Dwayne, you nailed it. Disco caused problems at a societal level. Was that due to disco? So when did we lose, when did the color line really become established? Man. Right, and I'm gonna tie it into, we're gonna, we're gonna still throw some hip hop in here for the younger audience. There's there's you know, one other. So go ahead, go ahead, I'll let you run. I was this. gonna say, there's one other song that definitely as Detroiters needs to be in there. And this, this, it goes right up there with some, like what you said, Mark, I was exactly, Mark, that was the same way with Madonna. Um, again, we presentation time frame. Um, I don't know if you remember uh, Devin, James, James Young. He and I are still pretty good friends. And James, um, he was one of the first people who had, um, had come to understand Madonna mm -hmm. through him. Mm -hmm. And I had known Holiday, um, uh, like a Virgin was obviously one of the biggest ones that kind of broke through. And I think it was that MTV performance. Oh man. That when they start kind of replaying it, it's like, wait a minute, what? This is, plus, you know, at that point you knew she was from Detroit, even though she's from- uh, Pontiac. Uh, it's, uh, it's, no, it's one of Monroe. She's from Monroe. Um, I thought she was from Pontiac. Monroe. I think it's, we, we can go look at, we'll look at Wikipedia, right? Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, um, 
the other song that I'm trying to, I, I'm building the suspense to is another one by Sadat. Is you had a, a rock group mm-hmm. from, not even from this country, but we also know how a lot of those groups had a much better appreciation for the blues and some of the rock uh, mm-hmm. our black artists than even we did, or mm-hmm. they were more willing to embrace it. Again, I mentioned the Rolling Stones. Their name, their name comes from a Muddy Waters song, mm-hmm. and so. Um, but like another one, "Bites the Dust." It took me forever to know that that was not uh, that that wasn't a black group because the the, the, the bass lines were pounding. Mm-hmm. We had adopted it as part of like the Detroit the, Lions. Like, like, yeah, exactly. And so <laughs> we were, you know, there was like a little uh, like a bootleg rap thing that we were doing. People had kind of come up with the lyrics and you you didn't necessarily hear it everywhere you just heard other people singing that was getting passed along but like i said those are um queen madonna um even culture club like you just mentioned it wasn't until you started seeing some of the magazines and there are a few people that i could actually name names um back in my presentation days that were all part of like bringing me to that music um whether it was like princess controversy or um, the other thing I talk about uh, often, quick sidebar, and it's probably opened up another can of worms, but um, I still remember the day when, uh, I don't know if you remember Paul Harris, that unfortunately he's, uh, he's, he's, he's passed away now, um, was uh, killed unfortunately, but I can remember clearly sitting in, coming in one morning and him saying, there's a new song by the Gap, Gap Band, it's called Outstanding, and it's crazy. And I was like, okay, like, so yeah, you go try to sneak and find. And every time I hear that song now, um, whether it's being sampled, whether it's Shaq rapping over to whatever, I go like, I remember when that song was like a new song. And now it's like, a, you know, it's an eternal classic, but I kind of took a sidebar there. But it's all of that is like part of that, what I like to refer to as the soundtrack of like my youth. Mm-hmm. And so um, like, uh, like uh, you put the dev- image up, Dev. The other thing is she's wearing the boy toy belt buckle. Mm-hmm. Um, that is a hip hop staple. And she was, you know, again, it's what we now refer to as a, like appropriation. Um, but, you know, these are all the things that was that were endearing her to her, her audience. And she understood she was she was in the club scene. She knew what was what was hot. She knew how to make things work, and she took it to another level. So, man, uh, I, I'm not ashamed to say I'm not ashamed to say that I, I was a fan of hers. Um, and she too, like Prince, did not necessarily continue to evolve the way that mm. maybe would have been the best to have a longer, mm. prolific career. Man, Mar, Thank what's you. up with that color line, man? I know we've talked about that a bit as well. Here it is. That was a good <laughs> point about Madonna because it's like. It, we got to this point where not okay we didn't may not necessarily want everybody to know we like madonna or like these other white groups but once duran duran phil collins <laughs> george I mean, michael every, every, oh dude you know that but then we get to a point where now i don't know how it was for t real but to probably say i like justin timberlake wasn't too cool gotta um, cut that off right there right <laughs> so when did that happen how does it all still tie in especially going back to the 70s Man, let me make this point because um, Dwayne brought up something I want to speak to also. Um, We're talking about music here, but in some ways we can't even, to get to the bottom of this question that you're asking, we can't really stop at music. We have to pull in other facets of the culture, right? And when I think of what happened with disco, and we remember the the famous, what was it, at Chicago Comiskey Park where people were throwing all the Mm -hmm. albums like Disco Sucks and all this other stuff, right? But we can't separate what happened with disco and white America rejecting these elements that challenge their conservative values, right? That comes with not only music, it comes with so many facets of things that come out of black culture. Like they're trying to keep the door shut, but then there's a piece of their community that wants it. This goes from Michael Jackson, this goes all the way. This goes back to Little Richard when they used to play segregated concerts. And Little Richard says, the white folks used to be up in the balcony, the black folks be on the floor. 
And by the time he got the jam and then white folks would jump off them balconies and they down on the floor dancing with black folks. Mm. So it's like, they're trying to keep the door closed. They're trying to would have like saved themselves you know there's this famous clip of this i don't know where this guy was from but it was an old black and white interview and this white conservative guy is like you know these this rock and roll is one way that you know the white man and his children is gonna fall you know to the level of the nigger what he said and this has always been the battle right now i'm not gonna get into why that is going on because me and Devin, that's something me and you talk about all the time i'm not gonna put in this video maybe some other time in another platform but not today but another example of this is for example basketball uh up until 1976 you had two basketball leagues you had the aba and the nba the nba was the established league right when they were talking about merging with the aba there was really a lot of fear because the ABA allowed so much, so many things that go outside of what the establishment expected on a basketball court. They were dunking, they were flying. You know, the, the brothers was on the court fighting. You had the, the scantily clad cheerleaders. All of this stuff was going on in the ABA. And they says, we don't want that over there. You know, the ABA, that's fun ball, but the NBA is what real basketball is about. And this is what happened by the time Dr. J and all of those ABA players started coming into the NBA, the NBA started to decline. And they openly said this. It's like, it's too many black players coming in here. They're coming here with this street ball. They're bringing black culture. They got these huge Afros. They're scaring the hell out of white America. We still deal with that culturally today because it's the same thing they said with rock and roll. It's the same thing they said with hip hop. It's the same thing that's going on right now. And to the point where white folks Remember, before I got in the NWA, white folks was listening to NWA and it wasn't even on the radio because they were fascinated with what was going on in the hood. So this NWA is always and go ahead. Yeah. Think about this is yeah. always this is always the battle over the soul of America. And um, what I hate about it is that when we we've talked about this extensively also, the problem that I have with the, the cultural mixture is that our side tends to get left behind they want to put everything mixed in well it's black folks it's people of color it's gays it's lgbt it's feminism and all of this gets rolled into one thing and black folks we still don't get a piece of the pie so this is what i'm saying the music is just one part of that but when we look at that mid-70s era we have to put all of this in there because everywhere you look we don't want those n words invading our space mm. right well Oh, okay, if they didn't want, they, now we're about to go into our normal show. Uh, they didn't want us invading their space. Uh -huh. Why do they seem to invade ours? Because y'all just made mention, when I think of, when you look at, um, did Ice-T want to make rock albums? Did Public Enemy want to do things with Anthrax? We look at Run DMC, what they did with Aerosmith. It's mm. almost like our music got kind of Force into their space. I think I, I do think there was a side of them that wanted to do that. Yes, because they right. appreciated the music. But right. I wonder how much the record labels as well was like, you know, now we get into that crossover phrase. Where right. we, well, you know what? It's cool that black teenagers like this music, but we want white teenagers to like it too. So we're gonna bring in this old group called Aerosmith because they album's been kind of yeah. going down for a while anyway. And we're gonna team y'all up together. And we right. know that made history. It brought Aerosmith right. back and made them relevant again. Exactly. But I gotta still always wonder, you know, people use the term jump the shark. You know, that was kind yeah. of lexicon for the longest time. And for T-Real, in case you don't know, jump the shark is a term. <laughs> it's actually a website like 15 years ago that was popular because jump the shark, it was like a way of saying something is now played, it's done. And it goes back to Happy Days, the TV show Happy Days was rolling along fine until they did this goofy episode where the Fonz had to uh, water ski over some sharks. And that's why they called it Jump the Shark. Like like Good Times basically jumped the shark when Jane, they killed off Jane. It's so, all right. Um, yep. So when we get to that point now, looking back with, with hip hop and with music, <clears throat> 
did that make Run DMC jump the shark? Did jump the Run DMC get played? Do they ever care oh what it God. does to the career of the black artist when they have to now go and become acceptable to a white audience? So I I used to probably be in a better position to answer that question of, about what happened with Run DMC. Um, in part, you had uh, the music was just changing. Um, and I'm glad you actually introduced Run DMC to this conversation. Um, today yeah, I'm actually with wearing... your shirt on. <laughs> so here's the thing. So um, oh, dang, you talked about, so I'm, I'm going to hit you with like four things and like spin your head, like just like boom, 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 boom. One is um, my three things are music, sneakers, and cars. So those are the three things that I can usually speak to with a little bit of uh, some sports here and there, but not really. Like I can talk decent enough, but it, they're not my in my wheelhouse. So I'm primarily a Nike guy. I love like especially like uh, classic Nike kind of shoes and that kind of thing. So I just so happen to have my like the one Adidas T-shirt, and I do have a few Adidas sneakers, but most of my collection is Nike. But um, what I was gonna say is. <laughs> The music changed from underneath them. Like Run DMC, they are they are part of that turning point. That was probably the only other group that um, or thing that I didn't talk about is like uh, like I know what happened and what changed. It's like one summer, it's like that comes out and everything changes. We come back to school and we're like hitting on our desks making beats. Um, it it totally changed. And like you said, I remember. Um, when Walk This Way came out and I didn't get it. Like, mm. it's not that I didn't like it. I didn't understand what was happening. The same way when Michael Jackson got with Paul McCartney mm. to do Say 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 <clears throat> and the Girl Was Mine. Like, I didn't get that this is a former Beatle that's trying to like even bring it back really quickly. Andy Christian was talking about John Lennon. I knew who John Lennon was because, mm. but I wasn't making that connection to say, Oh, John Lennon was part of this like group that changed music forever. That uh, Michael Jackson is doing like State of Shock that was bringing the uh, Rolling Stones back relevant when he's working with Mick Jagger. Mm -hmm. And the same thing was happening with um, Aerosmith. It's like I didn't get all of what was happening. I do think it represented kind of a, a shark jumping moment, if you will. But I think the other thing that was happening and. Uh, P. Real mentioned one of my favorite artists of all time, Big Daddy Kane. And as you have that emergence of the Juice Crew, Marley Mall, and um, you know people like Cool G. Rap, who are saying words like more words per second than Run DMC ever had said, and telling like vivid yes. pictures, <laughs> like like UB Illin or who I don't know who it was who put the because uh, I didn't know who's uh, was that too T real or was that Corey who had sent the oh, picture? Oh, I think that was Corey ring. earlier. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you know what? That is a classic. But when you look at how the lyrics, like, I remember Big Daddy came really, really started hitting like my senior year, just as I was like almost about to graduate. And one of the things I remember why I fell in love with his music so is like. He's saying like a lot of stuff. Yeah. Whereas Run DMC, they were rhyming, they were painting pictures for you, but it wasn't packed with the, the words. And I know you can appreciate this, Dev, and Marcus is even talking to you, I can get the same vibe. We went to, we had very strong like high school experiences that taught us to think harder about things. Mm. So when you get a Big Daddy Kane or like all these conscious rappers that were coming along, they're talking about things in words that match the vocabulary that I wanted to hear. And I don't think it was, um, I don't think it was that Run DMC, like they sold out. They just couldn't keep up. Mm. And one of the very few experiences um, I was mentioning to my friend uh, Kevin earlier, when uh, and I'm going to make this quick because I'm getting caught in my memories here. So I don't want to take. But um, when Down With The Kings came out, Pete Rock had uh, put that together. If it, I, if you, if, if De La Soul is my favorite hip hop group, and we know this, um, if you spend any of time around, Pete Rock is my favorite producer of all time. Hands down, hmm, no question okay. asked. No, 
don't pass go. It's not a it's not a debate. And so, um, my wife is originally from New York. We had taken a trip out to New York, and we had actually gone to um, uh, at the time. If you in Mount Vernon, there was a, a real estate or a, a like office building. It's where it's in CL Smooth's uh, when they reminisce. He talks about his run his own business like his aunt Joyce. Um, all the, his his aunt's business was in that building as well as some uh, management of Pete Rock. And we had gone in. My buddy at the time dropped a mixtape off to them. And when they went in, he was literally getting off the phone with some of Run DMC's folks. Oh, wow. And he was saying they don't want to pay us the money for the song. And it's like we made them this hit and they don't want to pay us. And it was like it's just one of those kind of crazy moments. Are we getting but, a scoop here on the Black yeah. Prospector show? Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> and, then, you know, I never it's one of those things I don't even think about. It, it was just like this weird kind of timing and he's like yeah we just just got off the phone with it. and i don't like if he was putting on the show because he recognized oh these are these random dudes from michigan who are walking in and like trying to you know let me impress him with some of my new york like whatever but it was one of those things where in my head i remember thinking man how dare they like you are not relevant and people showed up in this video um and they, like you said they never did really hit their that was their, like in some ways their pinnacle. And they never really like got back to what we came to know them as, but it wasn't all the way their fault. It's just that the, yes. the, the game changed so quickly and there was nothing they could really do about it. And they were, they were good performers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, how much of their own stuff that they wrote. Um, we also know that Big Daddy Kane was writing a lot of that music for the Juice Crew. And so um, like, there became a huge emphasis, like I would say right around 88 or so, 87 even. I think Wu-Tang even talks about that in one of their songs, like 87 being one of the best years to them. We do get like Karis one coming on the scene more. And these guys are putting like serious words together. Mm -hmm. um, the stuff that Run DMC was saying just didn't cut it anymore. No disrespect to them. I, like I said, I love Run DMC, um, but they just couldn't, they didn't evolve. You know what that reminds me of, if I just want to, Deb, you can pick up, but I just want to throw this in because that just brought back a memory to me. It's funny how the culture evolves and it's like either you can roll with this, get on this train or you get left behind. And DMC for those first three years, let's say between 82 to about 85, 86, they, they serve what they were there for. They passed the baton on to another group at that point. But what this brings to mind uh, I, I think everybody remembers when they first heard LL Cool J too. Now, but this is what cracks me up about LL Cool J. He jumped off. What was that like? Late '84, okay? And people were jumping on the LL Cool train, Cool J train, and he was hot for a couple of years. But what happened towards the end of the '80s? Black hip hop was starting to move into black consciousness. And LL Cool J was all about, I'm bad, I'm the one, you know, I'm I'm the stuff, right? He was all about yeah, braggadocious. Bragging. Yep. Right, he was braggadocious. So I remember reading the story about how, I can't remember where the show was, but it was almost like, if, if, if I'm not mistaken, it was like they booed LL Cool J off of his show because they was just like, this is a, a time of PE, KRS-One, Poor Righteous Teachers, uh, X Clan, and here you got LL Cone coming on stage talking, you know, with his gold chain, and I'm this and I'm that. And people didn't want to hear it. It's like, dude, we on this train now. LL became passe for that moment because it was time to pass the baton on to the next stuff. Man, you're so right. right because me and Kurt, you know, another frequent contributor to the show, when back during that time, we could not <laughs> stand LL. We could not, I mean, on one end, we respected him because, I mean, obviously his scene in Crush Groove was like, you know, where, where they, I think Rick Rubin was looking like he was gonna shoot him. He was like, no, no, hold on. And then he was like, what did he say? Box. And then bam, he lit it up with Rick. Yeah, yeah. But it was like, you wanted to like this kid, but it was like, this kid is just, he a little too full of himself. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm gonna, T-Rail, I'm gonna come over to you next because I am reminded, the one you touched on, KRS-One, I still got to always throw it out here because we talk about culturally. 
Terrell, well, off before we started recording, you made that point about you've been in school all your life and didn't learn certain things. For me, You Must Learn was that song because You Must Learn when, now I got mad because that wasn't the version that was on the cassette, but the, the video version of You Must Learn, when KRS-One broke down race and where it started from, <clears throat> and and you know, when he got to that point, and he believed whites were superior, blah, blah, blah. It was like for the first time in my life, for the first time in my life, someone broke down race to me in history, and it was in a stankin' hip hop song. Right. Coming through a whole school system, living yep. in a predominantly black neighborhood, and no one had ever explained race to me until I hear about it in a hip hop song. It's, excuse me, real quick. I, I know who's next, but I got to drop this in because I don't know if you guys heard about this. Talking about this goes perfect with what you just said. I saw a video last week. KRS One is releasing a book on the history of the nigger word. Oh, perfect. Uh, hey. He's he's going into it. He was talking about how. This is connected to the word Niger. He's going to go into Nega. I was like, Karis, we got a book coming out talking about the N word. Boom. Yeah. Blew and, me and out. Once again, another scoop you get here on the Black <laughs> Prospect. Y'all better like and you know subscribe it. <laughs> with this fire that's coming from this, y'all. You better like and subscribe. That's the second one. T Real, what, what you got? I'm just listening. I mean, I, I, I'm just, I'm just trying to suck up as much as possible. Now y'all are, now y'all are, are moving on to names that. Oh yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that in that early '80s and moving, to, yeah, you get your ticket down over across to the right. So. <laughs> All right, we gonna we gonna we gonna only close, we're gonna only go about another 15 more minutes. And I, I'm glad we covered a lot. This is gonna be perfect to even split up. Perfect. So in our closing minutes, I am going to start with, we're going to come back. We're going to go to this reverse order again. T-Real, Dwayne, then Mark. Mark, I really want you to go last because it's because of something you said earlier in the week that I thought of this mm. question. Mm. Question is, in the final round, what is your favorite soundtrack and why? Mm. Y'all brothers talking about Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> So, what is your favorite soundtrack and why? t Real, do you have one? Because I know soundtracks aren't as large as they used to be for us. Oh, man. <laughs> so that, that in and of itself is a conversation. Mm -hmm. But do you have one? No. You said soundtracks probably on a movie or you're on, or on a, like, what do you mean? Soundtrack for a movie. Movie soundtrack. I guess now. Uh, soundtracks and everything else now, but I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'd go ahead and skip it. Yes. I'm not even. That's not even on me. All right, wait, wait, wait. Hold, it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Okay, I got one for him. I got one here for him, dude. That's gonna be your homework assignment. <laughs> He don't know about soundtracks, dog. You, you I, I know, I know, kind of about them, yeah. But like on on what, games or movies and stuff. But I can't, I can't really sit there and, and be like, oh yeah, like I'm not. It's not Black Panther, and then we keep going, and I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a different. It's a different era. You, it I is. didn't think about it too. It you is. just said it. it but is. it's truly a different era. Dwayne, favorite soundtrack. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> man. All right, so you're putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> here's the reason why. Um, my favorite soundtrack is actually the Forrest Gump soundtrack. And so, oh, yeah, I know you weren't expecting that. I know. I did and not so, expect that. Yeah, exactly. So but there's some others that are, are definitely, their songs, uh, so like Dead Presidents. Um, that one for sure has, uh, and, and it's funny because it's generational, right? There's not... I think where's the, I was looking at it just to remind myself again to make sure. Um, I think the only original song on there, and it's not even original, it's a remake, uh, Where's the Love, which you know is uh, Donny Hathaway and Roberta Flack. This one was a Jesse and Trina. But one of the reasons um, I would say we'll walk on by too is it started off with Isaac Hayes. 
And I always make this joke. I grew up in Detroit with the Motown sound, but I am a Stax guy through and through. So, um, so Isaac Hayes is Stax <clears throat> all up and down. Mm -hmm. um, there's also uh, Curtis Mayfield has it. There's Hell Below. And Curtis Mayfield probably is one of the most intriguing um, people. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Um, and all the different phases and things that he suffered through. So, like I said, there, there's reasons why I say Forrest Gump, but for <clears> sure, <throat> Dead President, there's a lot of old songs, but then the one with more original music, I would have to say is Juice. Um, you've got Uptown Anthem by Naughty by Nature, mm -hmm. and, and um, the song by Guy, uh, Don't Be Afraid. So, like I said, Dang, I was kind of all over. I forgot about uh, that joint. So, um, and then... I already touched on this. My favorite movie, probably of like a, of a coming of age movie, is definitely going to be Boys in the Hood. But there are not a lot of songs on that soundtrack that I go like, oh, I, I really like that one. I think um, you know, I was going to say P Rock had a song on that, but there's on a, I think that's on Menace Society, Death Becomes You. So I, I've, I've thrown a lot out there, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, that, it, it was that was kind of a tough question. Hmm. Good, good, good. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> All right, let me just set this up because um, this, the, yeah, me and Dev talked about this earlier this week, and this actually comes from something that I saw Morris Day post last week on his Instagram. He says, you got to choose one soundtrack. He had, what? He had Waiting to Exhale. Mm -hmm. uh, he had... Uh, the bodyguard soundtrack he had uh purple rain yep. he had superfly he had shaft saturday night fever and it was one other i can't remember what the other one was it was like seven of them and it was like it was it was just it it, it narrowed down the two for me i mean like you know i love prince to death but those two I, I can't choose one but i still my life just superfly and shaft are just like the pinnacle of black exploitation soundtracks to me and there are so many others that I could choose from. And he mentioned Curtis Mayfield because that's another artist that I used to always hear in my mother's, my, my mother, my parents' house. You know, Curtis Mayfield, um, he did another soundtrack for this movie called Claudine that's incredible. Isaac Hayes has several good soundtracks, you know, Tough Guys. Um, is there anything else? Oh, and I have to throw this out here. I can't choose between Superfly and Shaft because they're both my all-time favorites. But I also mentioned this, is that it's a little known artist that never got credit, but he was out with that black exploitation era and he just never blew up. But this man named Willie Hutch, oh, he yeah. was a co-writer. If I'm not mistaken, he was a co-writer on the Jackson 5 song, I'll Be There. But he did the soundtrack for the Mac and he did the soundtrack for Foxy Brown. Them two need to be among the, the finest in black exploitation, but he never got his props for it. So I'm going to just say Superfly and Shaft. I have to split them between the two. Claudine, that was a good reference, too. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good soundtrack. Mm -hmm. I, can't... I think I might have that one over here on vinyl. <laughs> oh, there you go. I, my father had that on vinyl. So, hey, oh, yeah. I can't I'm pretty sure I do. Wayne took mine because I thought I might have the little kind of hidden pick. And once again, I guess because we all linked, Boys in the Hood was the one I was going to say because movie soundtrack movie soundtrack and number one it was like you said what the movie meant to me but it goes into what i was saying about t real there were songs on there that you one you didn't hear them on the radio about the only one that was played on the radio was how to survive in south central that one you know again i go back to the old no uh-uh uh no, no, no 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 just me and you. Oh yes, that oh, one. Yeah, because I had the R&B. That was clean. You didn't, they didn't have to worry about cleaning it up either. So, what else was okay? Wait, there was a song by Tevin Campbell on there. There was a Tony Tony I'm Tony. I'm looking song. at it now. Yep. There's the uh, there. uh, yeah, How to Survive in South Central. Out. What else was, was on there? Quincy Jones has one. I'm looking at it. I'm cheating. I don't remember all these songs. So there's a <laughs> had one that I, that I like. Um, and then you had the other one. The other one that really I really love was main source, just a friendly game of baseball. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you had Stan yeah. Clark with oh, now that was... had the instrumental. Yeah. Why, did we kill our, uh, 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 why is there a gunshot in every corner? Because they want us to right. kill ourselves. They want us to mm -hmm. kill ourselves. 
and you know you just hear that um mm -hmm. but i think i mean i agree with Dwayne said it's i remember a lot of the songs just because of what that era meant to me but it was i i picked that because it was the kind of soundtrack that i could put it on and just ride with it there there weren't a whole lot of you know press fast forward on that soundtrack and that was why i liked it and you threw in minutes to society I mean, I almost want to say the soundtrack to Minister Society was almost better than the movie. I mean, the movie was good, <laughs> relatively speaking, at the time. But the soundtrack had some hard-hitting songs. And you mentioned that one with, man, with Pete Rock put together on that. It was that, I remember the bass. The bass in Death Becomes You had my car sounded. You know how you always got that one song to make your sound system sound better than it actually is? That was that song. Um, and then I, I, I have to say, since you took boys in the hood i would actually have to go spike lee always has some pretty tight soundtrack hmm. and so uh do the right thing was always one obviously fight the power was the main one on there but it was just a lot of good jam i don't want to give him complete credit because if you go back to um what was it crooklyn basically it yes. was all he did is just take the original and just put him on there as the soundtrack but um, I think I always like Do the Right Thing. I, think we all, I also like School Days, uh, when that song that the Rays made, that was always one of my favorite. But I'm going to go Do the Right Thing since uh, you took Boys in the Hood. But Dang. I think it, when we go back to T-Real, it goes to show that that's just <clears throat> something that's even missing now. Because right. I don't think there's a true appreciation for the soundtrack when you have artists that you might, they might truly be a one hit wonder. But that one hit they made was on mm -hmm. a particular soundtrack. Mm -hmm. That might be the only song that got some radio rotation. Or it might, you might find maybe a version of a song that might not be anywhere else. It was like artists, it was, I think it was an honor for them to be on somebody's soundtrack. So they always brought that yep. extra <laughs> when they did. Well, there was even a point in the music where there was this whole conversation where soundtracks were actually better than some of the movies. Yeah, and this was like yeah. um, I'd say like late '90s. Um, that was like uh, the person who managed to be on a lot of them was Joe, and mm. there were a number of ones that he was on. And kind of the general consensus, like, well, his song is banging, but like <laughs> the the movie is not so great. And so, <laughs> T. Real, you want to give us a video game one for your audience, then? So, so I'm not so I'm not going to go that route, even though I could go ahead and, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go that route. But, so what I did, what I did do is I remembered, like, some movies. I'm like, all right, I'm more like that 90s, early 2000s guy. So I went, I'm sorry, what movies have I seen? So, Love and Basketball. Ooh, I just probably he just there talked about that. The love and basketball was probably that. the one. Now I didn't <laughs> look at that. I didn't see. I haven't watched Love Bones. That's mm. on me. I haven't watched. That's a good soundtrack. Yes. The only reason I'm going through is like, what do I have that off the top of my head? I already know what I have. Something, something. Uh, the sweetest thing, never enough. The Groove Theory. Um, Dude. I got can't get enough Kenny Lattimore, you know. Dude. So there's 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 a few. That's why I'm like, okay, it's between Love and Basketball and Love Jones, because obviously Guy I like. Um, I'll go Soul Sister by Bilal, um, Love and Happiness Al Green, Sweet Thing Shaka Khan. So Love and Basketball, Love. Jones. Okay, you go. okay, wait. I gotta put this <laughs> in here. I gotta put this in here right quick because nobody mentioned this. I have to go back to this memory of this particular year because I'll never forget. I was working midnights at the time at our favorite supermarket. And it used to be this brother that used to come in and he would shelve the bread. And he was always, he would always, he's the first guy who was telling me about, have you heard Mary J. Blige's new album, right? Or it was her first album. And he was talking about, man, have you heard this rapper named Busta Rhymes or something, right? He made a cameo on the album, we remember that. But it was the year 1992 and two movies came out that year. And they both had blockbuster soundtracks. One was Boomerang, and the other one was Mo Money. Uh, yep. You had Ellie and Babyface on one album, mm -hmm. and Jam and Lewis on the other album. Yes. And it came out yep. in the same year. That Mo yep. Money soundtrack was a sleeper. I mean, once again, it was. It was <laughs> in the movie. <laughs> so I had to actually. This is a true story. Um, I, for the first time, 
So I, I dated the same person throughout college, and I'm still married to her now. Hmm. Um, well, we watched Shanice. Um, I went to visit her for the first time in New York. That the movie I, I went with her and her sister to see, mm. um, and just mm. to kind of challenge your your hip hop knowledge. So my wife is originally from the Bronx. We went to see Mo Money at Bay Plaza, and why it was a big deal to me is because Nice and Smooth, Greg Nice said in one of his songs, "You go to Bay Plaza to catch a flick." And so, like, that was a big deal for me. Like, well, I just went to the movie theater that uh, uh, Greg Nice is talking about in his song. Hmm. But um, you, you're right. That Mo Money soundtrack was 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 actually a banger. That had a, the main song was the best thing in life for free. Mm -hmm. Janet was, Luther. Uh, Janet and Luther. And so, yeah, that that that's a good call out uh, to that that time frame. Because those are those were two of the, the great movies, then, so um, and good soundtrack. So, I mean, you saying that is just why when I come back to my fat boys again, <laughs> my kids even know if I get if I see a Sabaros, we yep. stop them because yep. I totally get that. To <laughs> it was yep. like, I gotta go there. So it was uh, that that's that's a part of of, it, and I guess it's a good way to kind of close it out. Yep. Mark and I talk all the time because a lot of people aren't into music like they used to be when we were growing up, I think we we kind of, I don't want to say undervalue, I think a lot of the newer generation, maybe it's just my old geezer self talking, missing the connections that we make with music. And again, I'm going to say that's probably something that gets lost. In a way, guys, <clears throat> and, and, and T-Real, you're outside of this one because your dad is on the inside of this. But we are a generation that can truly say we were around for the creation of hip hop. Mm. We were a lot around for the creation of videos. I mean, we really- Video games. With video games, but I'm just thinking from a music video standpoint. Yeah. That's something that nobody even pays attention to much anymore. And we know what a pivotal role it played into making music. You. You couldn't just be a talented artist. You had to be a talented artist and also make a dope video. Exactly. Um, and it was a major production. We all know everybody, when you first got to see Thriller, the yep. whole well, Thriller for the first that time. Changed, changed everything. Yep. Right, and that was a big part. So even as we talk about the 70s, and maybe that's the downside of the 70s and the funk, is that it was between how big Motown was, and how big hip hop and later R&B would become, and like that 70s time period, <clears throat> again, I think you just gotta be a true, someone who truly appreciates music as a whole to really understand it still laid the foundation between mm -hmm. those two eras. It, 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 it connects them in the most perfect way to get us to where we at today. I wanna get his brother props because, okay, we, because we're from Detroit, obviously Motown is gonna be a reference, but I love the fact that he brought up Stax. Yeah because man, Stax brought this gritty sound that was, it was like the anti-Motown in some kind of way, mm. right? It, man, I, I was, I just recent, I mean, I've always known about his music, but really when I started venturing into, I've always known about Stax, but I, there's music that I knew that I didn't know was on Stax. I'm like, damn, that's Stax, dude. Stax, that was a hot label back in the 70s, dude. Yeah. We got to get in the way i came to truly understand how much it not dev i know we're way over time but uh <laughs> there was a, a all, pbs man. pbs special um <clears throat> number of years ago i was called um gosh it's blanked out on it and um it talked about the history of the stacks and mm. like stacks has a history to the culture like to the civil rights uh mm -hmm. movement you know like mm. tennessee in a way that like Motown is great. There's a, a, a documentary on Showtime, or uh, yeah, it was on Showtime about Motown that was done by uh, like Barry Gordy and um, Smokey Robinson. Phenomenal documentary, especially because you're getting their perspective and not somebody else's. Mm, but work. this one on uh, Stax it was a PBS one, and I can't think of. But if you ever get a chance to see that one. It's from like maybe 2004, 2005, somewhere in there. Um, it eventually is one of the reasons I took my kids to the Stax Museum um, because, like, they have been to Motown. Motown is, like I said, it's part of who I am. 
But like you said, there's this richness and there's a, a much Motown was all about polish and production and like image and like it was literally one of the things that I uh, I saw in that documentary is they would have these Monday meetings where they would go through like quality control and everybody that was part of Motown they would talk about like what was the up and coming thing. Those are all that stuff was fascinating, but there's something about the grittiness of a stack. Mm -hmm. Um like the it was it was at the heart of the, the civil rights era. So you get these sounds and you get like you get Otis Redding, like one of the best stories of anybody's coming into the music industry ever. Um it's great. Ooh. You know, the the Stax Motown comparison kind of reminds me of what I was saying earlier when we get into the puffy sound versus the rough riders it's like that exactly. you need it's both exactly. sides yep. you know yep. Yep. Man, i want to propose you, something for the next show okay, I'm, I'm sorry go ahead Dan. all right keep keep hold what you're saying because i'm coming all right all right because the one you actually went where i wanted to go on the next question you already gave one my what a parting gift to the audience remember y'all like yes. a, a parting gift you gave because we all are brothers who love to pass on information you gave people a documentary to check out i'm going to say go check out we brought it up earlier tales of the tour bus so mark yes. you know whatever you're saying what say what you're going to say and then throw out give somebody else some homework we already gave you real some homework but you can give other folks some homework as well all right well okay give them more insight you should actually know this one because we talked about this one too but maybe Dwayne doesn't know it and if he doesn't this is going to be a gold mine for you you know the first book I read by about Prince was written by Steve Ivory he used to have this magazine called Black Beat back in the early 80s he was the first one to do that I remember that did something about Prince but I'm going to recommend if you haven't seen now tell me now if you have seen it and I'll say something else but if you have not seen this you need to check out this series on YouTube called Once Upon a Time in Minneapolis. I've seen it. I have not you seen it, so I'll check need, it out. Okay. Need, it's okay. For, the, for the Prince fan, it is a gold mine because okay. there is so much stuff in it. This dude put together an incredible long, I think he's up to like 25 episodes now. And all he's doing is patching together interviews of people who were in Prince's circle. A lot of this stuff I already knew, but they brought out some nuggets in there that I never knew. And like, damn, they talked to Morris, they talked to Andre, they talked to Jesse Johnson, they talked to um, Jill Jones, they talked to Apollonia Vanity, they talked to uh, Eric Leeds. All of these people that were involved with Prince, you got to see it. Okay. Now, All right. let me say what I was going to say before, and this is this is something we might want to consider. It may be too time consuming, it might not be, but it'd be a really good. I think it would be another good episode. I used to buy, when I was, you know, early teens, I used to buy all of these fan type magazines right on Black Beat. There was another one called, I think it was called Soul Teen or something. They had this section at the end of the magazine where they would ask a popular musician, name your top 10 favorite albums. Now, you could do it in R&B, you can do it in hip hop. For me, I might go into jazz or whatever, but that might be a spectacle right there. Just if if it's too time consuming to do 10, we'll break down our top five R&B albums, our top five hip hop albums, or top five or whatever else, other genre you guys want to cover. I wrote it down. I think that's a good one. I like that one. one. Yep. That's a real good one. Because especially we like have that one. to think about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it could have been top to... five soundtracks. I mean, anything. Ooh, there you go. Mm -hmm. T-Rose, did you have anything you wanted to pass on to, the, to anybody to tell them to check out that you might have peeped out? Um, no, I don't have anything yet. I think I'm interested in hearing because I know that was all y'all's generation, 70s, 80s. Um, and obviously even afterwards too. I'm interested in hearing after that 90s, 2000s, hearing what you guys have to say about that because um, that's, that's all where my origination is. And yeah, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of heat in there that hmm. I could definitely, I would say me, I'd be like, forget funk. I throw in on some stuff in there and destroy it. But that's just me. You know, I got to go ahead and pay homage, obviously, to everybody took this and they just feel more So I'm not going to I'm interested in that. 
All right, homework for everyone. Homework for everyone. Because we, we want to give you real chance to shine on the next discussion. So mm. yep. we're going to make that one the next one because we spent a lot of time in the 70s and 80s. So we're going to yep. do you a solid. We're, before we move on to our top albums, we'll move on to the 90s and the 2000s. So our homework, guys. And T-Real, you can still do it as well, but our homework, guys. Who is your favorite producer in the 1990s and 2000s? Okay. So we'll start from there because- Hip hop or R&B? Either one. But I, I was thinking more along the R&B line. Mm, okay. Because Terrell, you make a good point. Once we get the 90s and 2000s, actually it still all connects to the people we just got done talking about in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. So that's what's mm -hmm. gonna make this, this perfect. This perfect. Mm -hmm. All right, y'all, I'm, I'm gonna close it out there. Brothers, y'all brought the heat. This is what I expected. I appreciate it because I learned a ton. Uh, y'all, class was in session. So we're going we're gonna to end this school day now. <laughs> and we are going to pick this back up in a upcoming episode. But we're going to move to the 1990s and the 2000s for music. Brothers, I appreciate y'all. Thank y'all for the time. I know it's late. Folks, remember like and subscribe below. Uh, I'm gonna start trying to get these put up for podcasts as well. But um, you know, we this is gonna be a long, ongoing series because I think we talk a lot about relationships and social issues as well. But music is the soundtrack, literally, for all of that. Marcus and I have had conversations about ladies that we knew in the past, and it's like, you know, what song was out then? And we ain't even going to get into the point about we talked about this on our last episode last week, actually, with Corey and T. Real. We talked about dude simping. And so that's why Mr. Perfect, Mr. Perfect is always saying what the ladies want to hear. Good morning. I've made you breakfast in bed again. And we said, I might have to change Mr. Perfect's name to Babyface. Because what, I, what look what Babyface did to a whole generation of men with the simping music he made. I'll so, pay your rent. I cook I your dinner. Your I cook your dinner. When? All of this after I get off work. <laughs> <laughs> so it all ties in together. So thank y'all. Appreciate it. Folks, you know, again, hey, we digging for gold. We were digging for gold tonight in music. But as always, I'm going to just close it out. You know, dig for gold in your family, in your children. Because if there's another thing that, that I'll, I'll throw this out as my last tip on the dad side, the greatest thing that my kids always, always, always remember me doing is watching unsung with them. And so, um, you know, a lot of them are hard to find on YouTube, the episodes and whatnot, but it was especially homeschooling and I don't play any instruments. So that was still my appreciation for music. I was able to pass on to them. And it's so funny, another game we always play in the car. You know, I know back in the day, you know, folks will look at license plates and make things up. We play games on, I, I, I have a playlist of, you know, I, Dad's Jacking for Beats. That's the name of the playlist. So I put together songs. And so since it's on shuffle, you know, they might, bam, Curtis Mayfield may come on. And then it might be a half hour later and then all of a sudden, whoever somebody sampled Curtis Mayfield, especially if it's a clean version, y'all know it's hard to play that game sometimes because it's hard to find a clean version of certain hip hop songs. And it's like, they got to remember. Perfect example I'll leave out with that most people slip up on, but I'll throw it out here to you guys because you know, the song will come on. Tow, 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 tow. I shot the sheriff. <laughs> you know that? EPMD. And, and right, uh, who did they get it from? Oh, from uh, 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 Bob Marley. Sorry. Nope. <laughs> oh, no, no. Okay, so are you talking about the, uh, what's his name? Eric Clapton version? There you go, that version. Okay. All right, okay. <laughs> the Eric Clapton version. So they hear Eric Clapton, and then, you know, and then they got to remember, oh, who did they get that from? So it's those little things like that that I think as fathers, again, that's something we bring to the table with our kids, is teaching them in these conversations about music, the industry, culture, et cetera. If you wanna know where to start with homeschooling your kids or some activities you can give, even if it's the summertime and they bored, they don't have anything to do, and you appreciate music, there's an easy one for you right there. 
You can just turn on an unsung episode, watch it, and then tell your kids that story. And if you really want to make it interesting, have them go back and start researching the album sale. Have them start calculating how much those artists actually didn't get out of what those album sales were. And next thing you know, you have a whole week of a project where they understand the whole music biz and everything in a whole different way. So that's the homeschooling tip. Well, so as we close out, I'll, any last words, gentlemen? I don't want to cut y'all off. Y'all got anything to throw out there? Uh, thanks for putting it together. Uh, we know I know we have been threatening it for a while, and I was like, I just need to get to you sooner before or later. And I'm glad we finally got a chance to make it happen. Good man, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming, T. Real Mark. No, I appreciate it. Now, this is definitely a great lesson for me. I always remember where the, the roots were in the, in the beginnings and then building from there. So obviously I have not even scratched the surface on <laughs> my my research and diving in into crates, but I'm for sure gonna go ahead and dive back in. So Is there for you, Mark? Oh man, it was a. Uh... I got a, uh, I'll, I'll just quote a Prince song. It, it, it's, it was a beautiful night. <laughs> I'll say that. I can't, we got to do it again. That's all I can say. Got to do it again. This was an incredible introduction, but we just scratched the surface. All right, brothers. I appreciate y'all. Thank y'all. We're closing out. Everybody. All right, man. Take care. I'm out. See you later.